The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the crowds, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, since this is a novena, before I say a few words to you of my own thoughts on St. Monica, we're just going to begin there with the St. Monica prayer on your uh, leaflet that you got. So at one stage, there's a, a request to be thought as well, so you might just like to think of that as we say this prayer. So you might say it all together. St. Monica, troubled wife and mother, Many sorrows pierced your heart during your lifetime, yet you never despaired or lost faith. With confidence, persistence, and profound faith, you prayed daily for the conversion of your beloved husband, Patricius, and your beloved son, Augustine. Grant me that same fortitude, patience, and trust in the Lord. Intercede for me, dear Saint Monica, for those in my heart. And grant me the grace to accept his will in all things, through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A few years ago, I received an email from a friend of mine. You know what those are. They can uh, waste your time as much as you like. And the email was entitled, I bet you'll watch this email twice. And I said to myself, no, I'm not going to waste that much time. So I played it. And it showed two teams of basketball players. And the, the captions said, count how often the basketball will be passed. So off they set. And one pass, two pass, three pass, four pass. Until it came to 13 passes. And then it said, the answer is 13 passes, but did you notice the bear moonwalking across the court? And I said, no. So I played it twice, just as I said I would, and the same question came up, and off they went, one pass, two pass, three passes, and then out of one side came a bear, obviously a man dressed up as a bear, walked across the court, waved to the camera, and went off to the other side. And I had never noticed it. And the, the video was brought out by London County Council in England. And the point behind it was that if you're not watching for something, you're unlikely to see it. And in particular in this case, motorists are unlikely to see cyclists. And it was very interesting, of course, to, to see this. And we see this all the time in our own ways. So I remember uh, my mother has a car which is green. It's not green in terms of being environmentally friendly. It's green, green, green. It is bright green. As a matter of fact, sometimes I've borrowed it and passed through little villages and see the, the kids pointing at it and laughing because it's so green. And one day she said to me, 
that I might meet her outside a, a certain shop and I'd help her carry the, the, the bags of shopping home. And so I drove the car up and I waited there and I saw her coming and she walked right by me. And then she was looking around and I got out and I, I said, didn't you see me? And she said, oh, I thought you were walking. So she walked by her own car, which was luminous green, the most awful green that you could think of. Don't tell her I said that because she wasn't expecting to see it. So we, by and large, unless we're expecting to see something, we tend not to see it. When you think of God, what do you expect to see? What do you expect God to be like? Because the way we expect to see God is often the way that we'll see him unless things really uh, surprise us in, in some ways. I just want to tell you two stories about people who were surprised by God in various ways. In the 1700s, there was a man in France, and his name was Blaise Pascal, and he's a mathematician. So if any of you here are studying math, you might have come across something called Pascal's Triangle. He's still famous today for his mathematics, and he also uh, was a great religious writer too. And on the days after he died, his servant was going through his clothes. Okay, so everybody had servants in those days, unless you were a servant. And he felt a bulge in one of his coats, and he went searching, what's this bulge inside in this coat? And he, he opened up the, the thread, and he found inside it a page sewn into the coat with these words, from about half past ten in the evening until about half past midnight, fire the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, not of the philosophers and intellectuals, certitude, joy, certitude, emotion, joy, the God of Jesus Christ, joy, 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 tears of joy. So what was Pascal saying? He'd had this tremendous experience of what God was like. He'd had this most remarkable spiritual experience, and it was of God as fire, fire and then certitude, joy, joy, tears of joy. And he'd never told anyone about this, which, in my humble opinion, is one of the most remarkable spiritual experiences of God in all time. It reminds us, of course, of Moses. You know that Moses, when he first met God, he met him in the burning bush. And that as Moses went up the mountain, people saw Moses thought he was going into a cloud. But when the people, they looked at it, they saw it was like a fire, a consuming fire. And that's uh, one of the lines in the scriptures as well, that our God is a consuming fire. So most of us come to Mass, and when we come to Mass, we come to Mass, and we just go to Mass. Do you know that we're standing on a volcano? Do you know that there is a fire in this church? Not a fire that's impersonal and destructive, like a volcano, but a fire that is personal, in fact a fire that is three persons who have always lived, always loved, and who are always a fire, loving each other, a volcano of love, and you and I are standing on it. There's another Frenchman, this time in the late 1800s, many, many years after Blaise Pascal, and he was a young soldier in the French army which at that stage ruled a lot of North Africa. And he used to make maps. And some of the maps of Morocco that you'll still look at today, I'm sure many of you look at maps of Morocco every night, isn't that right? But he was the first one to put a lot of the, the points and the mountain heights on it and so on and so forth. So a very intelligent man. And he'd rejected the Catholic religion of his childhood. He found it no good for him whatsoever. But now he was out in the Sahara, and as he sat in the Sahara there in the evenings, in these vast, empty valleys, they spoke to him of God, this, this great abyss without limit, utterly, utterly silent. They spoke to God. And I bet you, if I was to talk to you in this church, that many of you would have had an experience a bit like that too, that you'd have seen a sunset, or maybe you'd have seen the ocean, and they would have spoken to you of God. So our God is a fire. He's an absolute volcano, and he's an abyss of silence and emptiness and greatness, and yet 
full of person, full of those three persons of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I like to think of that. I like to think of God in those ways because, uh, as you know, and as you appreciate yourselves, I'm sure our tendency is always to think of God as being like the boss. Isn't that right? So people, I'm a priest, people come up to me and they say, how's your boss? Right? Of course, they're talking about the man above. Right? Uh, but God is much more than that. God is an infinite abyss of fire and greatness and love. And in the fullness of time, this God became one of us in the man, Jesus Christ. And among the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are many different portraits of Jesus, many different angles. But what I particularly like is in the Gospel according to Mark, because according to tradition, the Gospel according to Mark was written containing or reflecting, in a sense, the viewpoint of St. Peter. And there are some elements of Mark that are still very, very personal. And you can imagine how St. Peter was struck personally by the experience of being with Jesus for those three years. And it says in Mark, in the chapter 9, it says that Jesus was teaching his disciples and saying to them, the Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. So we're all familiar with that. Jesus predicting his own death and resurrection. Well, what does St. Mark say then? Maybe reflecting what St. Peter experienced. He says, but they did not understand the saying, and they were afraid to ask him. And then it goes on in the next chapter, in, in chapter 10 of St. Mark's Gospel, and it says, and they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. So two times, St. Mark mentions that the disciples were afraid of Jesus. And why were they afraid of Jesus, do you think? Was it because he was dangerous, or had a bad temper, or was harsh with them? None of these things. It was because he is the God of that infinite fire, that infinite abyss. And they followed him around, and they couldn't understand what he was doing, what he was talking about. Where was this man coming from? He was miles ahead of them all the time. And they were stunned by him. Stunned by him. And it's the same for us. That when we think of Jesus, Jesus is miles ahead of us. That he has a greatness and, uh, and a wonder that is so much ahead of us. And I think this is important for us to realize that our God is somebody that we can never figure out. Our God is somebody that we can never really know what he's doing. That he's always got plans that are working on a different level to our own thoughts. And for me, it's important to, think, to know this because it means that when I think of God, I know that there is somebody guiding my life who has a greatness that I could never comprehend and a love that I could never comprehend. He says to us, as he says to Martha, 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 you worry and fret about so many things, but not many are important. In fact, only one. And what's important is to trust him because the Lord is guiding our lives with a greatness that we can never understand. As he says to us in the prophet Isaiah, he says, and I will lead the blind in a way that they know not, in paths that they have not known, I will guide them. And it also reminds me how often we think of religion as a way of keeping in with God. That, you know, every atheist or every agnostic person, when it comes to exam time, they're all religious. Oh God, help me to get through this exam. Oh God, help me to get an apartment. Oh God, help me to get better. These are all good things to pray for. And the Lord Jesus tells us explicitly that we should pray for these things. But they're not the point. God is so great that the point of our religion, in fact, is very different. It is not for, to, uh, for us to live a good life here with God's help, a good life as we see it, but it's for us to surrender ourselves, to surrender ourselves to the fire, to surrender ourselves to the abyss of greatness that is that fire of love and certitude and joy, to surrender ourselves to him in trust that he is looking after us, in ways that we can't understand if only we will give him our hearts. 
And it reminds me of this, finally, that there is no gift so great that we can wish for our family and friends than conversion, and for ourselves too than to be converted every day. So Jesus, when he teaches us about perseverance in prayer and asking and trusting in God in the gospel, he turns around at the end and he says this. He says, I tell you, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. And then he finishes by saying, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And we read this and we say, the Holy Spirit? I'm not asking for the Holy Spirit. I'm asking for A, B, C. But Jesus is saying to us, yes, ask for A, B, and C, but there is no gift greater than the Holy Spirit, no gift greater than that uh, fire and that abyss of greatness to, to live in our hearts and to guide our lives as much as we allow him to. So when St. Monica prayed for her son Augustine to become a Catholic, she wasn't simply praying for him to change his opinion or to change his mind or to agree with her. But what he discovered when he converted was everything in God. And as he later wrote, speaking to God in his confessions, he says to God this, Late have I loved you, O beauty ever ancient, ever new. Late have I loved you. I tasted you, and now I hunger and thirst for you. You touched me, and I burn for your peace. I'm going to invite you now, just before the creed, to pray with me together the prayer to St. Jude, and once again to bring your own intentions to mind and to trust that the Lord, through his saints, is working these things out in ways that we can't understand. St. Jude, glorious apostle, faithful servant and friend of Jesus, the name of the traitor has caused you to be forgotten by many, but the church honors and invokes you universally as the patron of difficult and desperate cases. Pray for me, who am in need of God's mercy. Make use, I implore you, of that particular privilege accorded to you to bring visible and speedy help where help was almost despaired of. Come to my assistance in this great need that I may receive the consolation and help of heaven in all my necessities, tribulations, and sufferings, and particularly this. And that I may praise God with you and all the elect throughout all eternity. I promise you, O blessed Jude, to be ever mindful of this great favor. I will honor you as my special and powerful patron and encourage devotion to you. Saint Jude, pray for us and for all who honor and invoke thy aid. Amen.